on the scene He's got the voice that's mean Asking those questions that you never seen He's got that fire Burning bright and clean Andrew Keen Making waves Break the routine On the keen on show He brings the heat Asking the minds Digging deep till they bleed No sugar coated truths No lies to deceive Andrew Keen The master of the interview beat the knowledge he's got the flair challenging ideas with a fearless stare with every question he's uncovering what's there andrew key the true seeker he's aware hello everybody we are back with godwin's law that inevitable law that you can't have a conversation on the internet without bringing up hitler and we're going to do it right from the beginning <laughs> of course we live in an age where everyone's obsessed with hitler some people compare him with donald trump which seems particularly absurd americans are obsessed with the revisitation in a manner of speaking of nazism in america uh, but all this obviously is overdone sometimes perhaps always one man all too familiar with hitler and nazism is my guest today richard j evans he's perhaps the world's leading historian of Nazi Germany. He's the author of the Third Reich Trilogy, which many people consider the classic on Nazi Germany. He has a new book out, Hitler's People, The Faces of the Third Reich. Um, and Richard Evans is joining us from North Hertfordshire, uh, just outside <laughs> London. Um, Richard, before the Nazis and the Godwin's law about Nazis, was there an equivalent? Were people, for example, uh, before the 1930s, did they always bring up Napoleon or, uh, or, or, or somebody else to, uh, to talk of evil? They certainly did. I mean, through the 19th century, British children were frightened by their parents, by uh being told unless you're good bony will come and get you meaning napoleon bonaparte so that was quite an equivalent figure it's interesting because i'm not sure if you've <clears throat> seen uh, ridley scott's latest film about napoleon i actually rather enjoyed it I mean, it was entertaining um but certainly not profound um uh, napoleon was treated as a rather absurd figure could you imagine in a couple of hundred years we have an equivalent film about Hitler being a rather pathetic fellow. Well, it's been made already. Evil. It's been made already by Charlie Chaplin, the great dictator. That's a satire on 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 Hitler and the Nazis. So it's not but, the first time it's been ridiculed. But not so much ridiculed as marginalized, turned into a kind of footnote of history. I think. That has been a claim I was, uh, of some extreme right-wing commentators and politicians, but I don't really think that's going to happen. I think the Nazis' evil fact that they killed six million Jews deliberately and for no other reason that they were Jews, that they launched the hugely destructive World War II, those things alone, I think, have damned them to eternal infamy. Richard, you've dedicated your life to the study of Nazi Germany. You've written other books as well, but your name is always associated with, with the Nazis. Um, why did you do this? Did you always set out? Were you always fascinated as uh, somebody growing up in Essex um, from parents who were Welsh? Were you always obsessed with Hitler? Yeah, well, uh, we lived on the fringes of the of the East End in London. So we'd go there, you know, late and stone, late and hackney and so on. And uh, I would see, even when I was four or five or six, it was very striking, the bomb damage in the East, still in the 50s, uh, which, uh, uh, which had taken out houses from rows of terraces and so on. And I wondered who had done this um, and why, you know, where did all this come from? And then, of course, my parents had been in the war in one way or another and their friends and uh, all the politicians and major figures had been uh, wartime figures. So uh, it was a big theme. If you grew up in the post-war years, like a, a baby boomers like myself, uh, then it was a, a, a major thing. And that got me interested in it. And then when I got to Oxford as a student in the mid-60s, mid to late 60s, 
then, <clears throat> of course, German history was just waking up from a long slumber caused by the uh, unwillingness of the Germans themselves to confront their recent past. And so it was a very, very exciting time to get involved in German history. E extremely exciting. There were great debates in the 60s <clears throat> and 70s, which you became embroiled in about Nazi Germany. Perhaps you might remind our, our viewers and listeners of what those debates were about, the, the, the historiographical situation, if you like, that you found when you, be, when you entered the field. Yeah, well, it was the 70s by the time I did my doctorate. And at that time, then there was brewing up a huge controversy in Germany itself. First of all, about the long-term origins of Nazism. Uh, did it go back before World War I? Uh, and I was fortunate enough to know and study with Fritz Fischer, who was a very, very controversial major historian in Germany, who argued yes, uh, and younger historians joined in. Joined in, and and that then it, uh, the books about Germany's aims in the First World War, for example, with comparisons and with Germany's aims in the Second World War and imperial germany under the kaiser as a kind of anti-chamber to hitler's third reich so i got involved in in that and then in the 80s there was a so-called historian's dispute which uh, in germany itself again in which some conservative historians tried to draw a line under the past encouraged i have to say by ronald reagan uh, who wanted to strengthen a west german uh, consciousness and and uh, against the threat from the evil empire in the east so all that was very very exciting i've been listening to an excellent podcast on the origins of the first world war the rest of his the rest is history i'm your, sure you you're you're familiar with that podcast you've probably yeah. been on it um what's your take on the causes of the first world war and the connection between the catastrophe of the war particularly in germany and the rise of, of the nazis well, the origins are a different matter in a sense, because it's a very chaotic set of circumstances in which I think everybody, all the participants had some axes to grind and some war aims, including France and Russia uh, and Britain. But by the time the war was over in 1918, uh, it was a catastrophe for Germany, an unexpected, sudden, complete defeat. And the peace settlement of the Treaty of Versailles, of course, then uh, took away 13% of Germany's territory, banned Germany's uh, manufacture and use of combat aircraft and uh, uh, capital ships. Um, it was, uh, and restricted the army size to 100,000 people, 700,000 men. So uh, it was a, a bitterly resented. It came as a surprise to the Germans because the army were running Germany by 1918 effectively had uh, refused to admit that they had any problems at the front, had painted a picture of Germany inevitably going to win until just a few weeks before they had to admit defeat. So it was a trauma. And I think that is the key to Nazism, the rise of Nazism. Does that, uh, and 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 I, I, I've got to be careful here, you you're a veteran of these kinds of conversations. <clears throat> Does that give some degree of moral excuse, though, for the rise of Nazism? The appearance to many Germans that they didn't really lose the war, that they were stabbed in the back, that they, the origins of the war are still massively debated. The idea of Germany being evil before the First World War that may have been put forward by the French and the, and the British doesn't seem particularly convincing these days. Does that give some sort of moral excuse for the the rise, at least, of Nazism, of the anger, of the hostility to the West, of the obsession with rearmament? Well, there was a French historian who once said to explain everything is to excuse everything. But that's not really true. I think you can explain things and, and adduce larger factors, etc. But in the end, we all make our moral choices. Uh, I could... Uh, quote Karl Marx here, uh, people make their own choices, they make their own history, but not under circumstances of their own making. Uh, but that doesn't reduce them to mere creatures of history. We all, we all have our, our a degree of moral autonomy. So, uh, and you also have to remember the Nazis never won more than 37% in a national, free national election. 
So the majority of Germans all voted always against the Nazis as long as they were free to do so. So I think uh, that's a kind of difficult question. But in the end, uh, the great majority, even of those Germans who fought at the front in the First World War, were not Nazis. They were socialists, they were communists. Uh, and we have to explain it while we remember that basic fact. You just quoted Marx. Um, you've written a book on Eric Hobsbawm, uh, one of the most distinguished, if not the most distinguished Marxist historian of the 20th century. I'm sure you knew him very well. I'm a friend of his daughter, as it happens. What school of history, the Marxist school, the British empirical school, what school do you think does the best job of making sense of the rise of, of fascism? and Hitler in particular? Well, uh, th there's a real problem with Marxist interpretations of the rise of Nazism, uh, because all Marxist historical explanations, including those of Eric Hobson, whom I did know, and wrote a biography of, uh, they all depend on class. It's class conflict as the motor of history, and you cannot explain uh, the rise of Nazism by that, because racism, and racial prejudice and anti-Semitism are central aspects of that. And it's you can't write anti-Semitism off, which after all led to the death of deliberate murder of six million Jews in the Second World War by the Nazis and their allies. You can't write it off as an expression of class conflict. You've got to look to other things. So uh, I, I'm not sure you can talk really about schools of history. I mean, you can sort of talk about class, but it doesn't explain everything. It's clear, and a massive amount of historical statistical work has been done on this, that the Nazis were predominantly middle class, but they also had quite a lot of support from other social classes, including the working class as well, uh, the unorganized, ununionized working class. So um, class does not really work as, a, as an explanation. Is a central issue then, uh, Richard Race? We're, we're going to come to Hitler's people in a, in a few minutes, your new book, The Faces of the Third Reich. Perhaps we can join the dots in terms of their obsession with race, in particular with the Jewish question. The Jewish question, of course, always existed in, to, 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 to use a euphemism, in the, in the 19th century, uh, with massive amounts of anti Semitism, both in Central and Eastern Europe. Is that for you the thing that? most defines the rise of Hitler and Nazism? Well, uh, again, uh, it's, it's in, you have to remember uh, anti-Semitism was not pervasive or all important in pre-Nazi Germany. The Jews in Germany were less than 1% of the population and they were scapegoated by Hitler largely uh, on the basis of this uh, crazy uh, conspiracy theory that Jews everywhere simply by nature of being Jews were trying to subvert and destroy Western civilization, particularly German civilization. So anti-Semitism is common to all the people. My book is a collection of uh, just under a couple of dozen biographies of Nazis from the top, Hitler, begin with Hitler, down to uh, the lowest level of perpetrators and sympathizers and fellow travelers and so on. And uh, they they all, to some degree or other, were anti-Semites. They believed, they bought into this conspiracy theory. But during the last elections of the Weimar Republic, the free elections from 1929, 30, 31, 32, uh, the Nazis played down their anti-Semitism because they realized it was not particularly popular in Germany. As soon as Hitler came to power, it was blasted out. It's paranoid anti-Semitic conspiracy theory from every corner of the mass media, the educational system, and all the rest of it. I don't want to bring up Trump too many times. He's perhaps the Hitler of our age and God with his law. <laughs> But uh, it, might it be similar in the way in which Trump seems to be playing down the abortion issue in the upcoming American election? Well, I think parallels between Trump and um, uh, and Hitler are quite misleading, really. Uh, as, as Mark Twain is supposed to have uh, remarked, uh, Hitler never repeats it. Uh, sorry, history. <laughs> history doesn't repeat itself. But that, that was a Freudian era, uh, uh, Richard. Uh, Hitler doesn't it, repeat himself. Yeah, well, I was going on to say something else about Hitler. So 
history doesn't repeat itself, but sometimes it rhymes. And so in Trump and Hitler, you can see a determination to destroy democracy, to establish an authoritarian state, uh, to suppress opposition in one way or another. But uh, Hitler was far, far more extreme than Trump. Trump doesn't go around murdering his opponents, which Hitler encouraged from the very beginning, from the 1920s onwards, even before he got into power. Trump uh, is not someone who proposes to put uh, Jews in concentration camps and kill six million of them. And perhaps the most important difference is that Hitler, like other fascists in the 1930s and uh, other authoritarian le leaders of that era, is a product of World War I. And, and uh, Hitler put the uh, he put war, expansion, nationalism, and conquest and militarism at the center of his beliefs. So uh, Hitler, he says this so many times, uh, it, it wants war. He wants the European war. He wants never ending war. Only through war can a people like the Germans, he says, uh, continue to be tough. Uh, and the survival of the toughest and the fittest is what he's looking for. So Trump's an isolationist. Trump has, uh, wants to withdraw American involvement in the rest of the world. He certainly does not want to invade and conquer Mexico or Canada. So uh, quite the contrary. So there are really big, big differences. That doesn't mean that Trump is not an enemy of democracy. It clearly is. Uh, and if you look at the kind of tactics of falsification, manipulation, lies, uh, and so on that he uses to try and uh, get support and would, if he became president, I think, implement in uh, his next second presidency. I think all of that is common with Hitler, but there's so many differences as well. Yeah, it's funny. I've always thought that comparing Trump to Hitler is an insult to the legacy or the, the crimes of Nazism, but Trump seems such a buffoon. But <clears throat> You mentioned Charlie Chaplin, who presented Hitler as a buffoon. There must have been a point in the 1930s where the consensus was that Hitler was just a, a, a buffoonish demagogue who would end up in a ditch somewhere. Was that the there was a, a was there a consensus in the 30s, uh, Richard, on on what would happen to Hitler? I don't think so at all. No, uh, there's a massive amount of misunderstanding of Hitler in, in the 30s. He was seen as somebody who wanted to right the wrongs of the peace settlement of 1918 to 19. So that's what appeasement meant. Appeasement meant, and championed by the British Conservative government of uh, Baldwin and Chamberlain, and also by the French with Daladier in the, in the vanguard, uh, if you gave in to some of Hitler's demands, the incorporation of Austria into Germany, the uh, incorporation into Germany of the German-speaking borderlands of Czechoslovakia, uh, the uh, 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 remilitarization of the Rhineland, which the 1918-19 settlement had uh, made German troops withdraw from. All of that was thought, well, the First World War uh, settlement uh, had been based under the influence of President Wilson of the United States on the principle of national self-determination. So all Hitler seemed to be going for was to gathering German speakers, cultural Germans, from other countries and put them back in, in, in Germany. Uh, and uh, remember, these are new, weak countries, Poland, Czechoslovakia, uh, Austria. They uh, didn't even have, uh, uh, they, they didn't have um, a huge amount of sympathy in other parts of Europe. Did it become clear, particularly in March 1939, when Hitler then invaded the non-German speaking part of Czechoslovakia, uh, that Hitler was about more than that. So there was a lot of sympathy for him and sympathy for the circumstances in which he'd come, come to power. And uh, politicians in the West maybe didn't like the violence uh, that Hitler unleashed upon his opponents in the 30s, but they thought that would all calm down after a while. I don't think anybody thought there would be uh, a war until uh, quite late on in the 30s, apart from Winston Churchill, who could see what was coming. Uh, and that's part of the reason, of course, why he 
is regarded now as a great and perceptive statesman uh, who uh, I think was the right person to lead Britain in the years of the Second World War. Final question, Richard, uh, be, uh, on broadly before we get to Hitler's people. You noted that Hitler fetishized war. He'd been in the First World War. He'd seen <clears throat> the decimation at the front. Uh, and fascism or Nazism was driven by young men who had come back from the law. Why did they create such a cult of war, given how appalling the First World War was? Perhaps the worst war, the most terrible war, the greatest slaughter in human history. It wasn't well, a lot, heroic of course, war at the front, was it? No, it became mechanized, didn't it, and impersonal. Uh, there's a German uh, uh, quasi-documentary novel by Ernst Junger that portrays that very well, uh, very uh, clearly, Storm of Steel, it was called. Well, again, you have to remember that the majority of front soldiers in the First World War, for German frontline soldiers, were not, did not become Nazis. They, be, they were social democrats and communists. Mm. There's a generation after uh, 19... Uh, 18, who were just too young to fight in the war. And uh, a lot of them, again, had a kind of determination to uh, rescue Germany from the humiliation that it had served. But quite a, quite a few of them, again, became became communists. So Nazism had different generations of people people in it. Um, I think uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a creed that emerged gradually in the 1920s. And if you look at those who individuals whom I study, from at every level of the Nazi movement, they all came from conservative nationalist backgrounds. There's not a single ex-communist or ex-socialist amongst them. Germany was a very, very divided country in the 1920s. And that was part of Hitler's message was he was going to unite the country again. That was a big part of his appeal. I mean, I I went back to the sources and I, I sort of ploughed my way through all of his speeches and his writings. And it was a major message in the late 20s and early 30s. I will unite the country. I'll break down these barriers again. Yeah, we're hearing that message from lots of politicians today. We, are, <coughs> we have the great honour of speaking to Sir Richard Evans. Uh, he is the author uh, of an important new book, Hitler's People, The Faces of the Third Reich. He's probably the world's most respected uh, authority, historian on the Third Reich and Hitler, uh, and his new book, Hitler's People, The Faces of the Third Reich, joins the dots between, quite literally, Hitler's people. I want to remind everyone that great guests, amazing guests like Richard Evans, are brought to us because of our friends at the Liberties, uh, a quarterly of culture and politics, going to run a short feature on Liberties, and then we'll be back with Richard J. Evans to talk specifically about Hitler's people. Uh, don't go away, anyone. We'll be back in a second. Beyond the news, the noise, there is nuance, insight. Liberties is not just a journal of ideas. It's a meteor of intelligent substance. It's the place to be for engaged citizens. Politics, opinion, substance. Liberties is a triumph for freedom of thought. A quarterly of urgency, of cultural exploration, of intellectual delight, of immaculate prose. It's invaluable. Subscribe now or find Liberties at your favorite bookseller. And you can subscribe to Liberties at libertiesjournal.com. We have the great honor today of talking with Richard J. Evans, uh, the world's leading authority on Hitler and Nazism. He has, has a new book out, Hitler's People, The Faces of the Third Reich. Richard, does Hitler have a person? Is there one single associate follower of Hitler who somehow captures everything about Hitler's people? Is there a Hitler person? I missed that, I'm afraid. Let me repeat that. Um, yeah. You've written this book, Hitler's People, uh, which is the faces of the Third Reich from his associates, his followers. Um, but is there a, a Hitler person? Is there one face of the Third Reich that somehow reflects Hitler's people? Um, no, I mean, the, I, I, I got these biographies to point out, first of all, that these are human beings. The Hitler and the leading Nazis and others who followed them have been demonized far too much. Of course, demonizing, saying that they're, they're, they're crooks, they're criminals, they are uh, a gang, they are people who 
are in some way or another psychopaths. All of that, I think, has been done far too much uh, and because it has the effect of distancing them from us. These are not like normal people, so we can simply avoid the question of what makes an RC. So what part of my aim here is to uh, as well humanize them, which is quite controversial in the, in the literature, especially in Germany, but to portray them as human beings. And of course, as human beings, there are a large variety of people. There are different, come from different backgrounds. So almost all of them are middle class, I have to say. Uh, I've also tried to undermine the common belief that these come from outside the mainstream of German society. You look at them, they're not marginal figures. Their backgrounds, their families are solidly middle class. A lot of them had what you might call the, the bourgeois uh, accomplishments of uh, uh, piano players, they played the violin, they listened to music, they wrote poetry, all that kind of stuff. Uh, they lived solid middle class life. But also common to a lot of them was that they had suffered some kind of major social uh, downfall, crisis, trauma in their lives. I think some of them, you look at some of them, father had been arrested for a crime, they themselves had been uh, thrown out of their jobs, all sorts of things like that. And Hitler was able to link those personal traumas up with the national trauma of defeat in 1918 to 1919. We mentioned the Marxist school of interpretation. You dismissed the, the class analysis, but there's a, a cultural school too, uh, the Frankfurt School, people like Adorno, who seem to suggest that in Nazism you saw somehow the, the the cultural corruption of what they termed bourgeois Europe, the bourgeois world, uh, in the way in which, as you suggested, Hitler's people, the Goebbels, the Himmlers, the strikers of the world, and we'll talk about one or two of them individually in a second, in the sense that they were middle class and came out of standard middle class life and had piano lessons, does that lend any credence to the, the, the Frankfurt School analysis of Nazism? Well, the Frankfurt School, uh, Adorno and Horkheimer in particular, uh, argued that there was a kind of uh, the authoritarian personality, which they identified with the Nazis, was the product of an authoritarian families, of fathers who beat their children, for example, uh, and Although that was not so uh, not so unusual in pre nineteen fourteen uh, Europe, you can't actually say that Nazis are dis people who become Nazis are distinguished by the fact that they were beaten more often than 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 other kids. You just can't know the detail at all, and it's a really rather implausible argument, I think, because it doesn't draw any kind of distinction uh, between uh, people who became Nazis and people who didn't. I don't doubt that a lot of leading communists in the Weimar Republic, and it was a major political movement with mass support, uh, had been treated rather badly as, as children. It doesn't really explain very much. What I think does explain some of it is the uh, fact, as I said, quite a few the Nazis suffered some kind of trauma in their childhood or family disaster, or like Ronald Heydrich, for example, one of the main figures in carrying out the Holocaust uh, had been uh, dishonorably discharged from the, the Navy, or Robert Lai, who's a now rather largely forgotten but very important figure in Nazi Germany. Uh, his father had been arrested and jailed when he was a child, and uh, and so and so on. So, um, what you can you can that, that I find that very very striking. And Hitler himself, of course, was a grew up in a respectable middle class family. His father was a customs officer in. Uh, Austria on the borders of Germany. And he was, uh, uh, by the time he was in his 20s, he was living on the streets practically. He had to live in a, a, a men's home for a while, didn't have a job, eking a rather frugal living until he got a, a legacy from uh, one of his relations. So he'd suffered a sort of social decline and crisis as well. And so in his speeches, he constantly reiterated a parallel that he drew between his own personal circumstances, uh, which had now become much better, of course, in the 20s, and uh, those of Germany and, and the Germans. And that runs a thread right through these biographies. 
I know you spent some time with Martin Amis, the author of The Zone of Interest, uh, an interesting book on a novel about uh, Rudolf Hoss, um, who you're all too familiar with. Uh, of course, it got made into a very controversial, I thought, brilliant movie by uh, Jonathan Glazer, which hmm. controversial for all sorts of reasons. Do you think that movie and, and, and the, the Amos book, they're very different enterprises, the book and the movie. Do they reiterate your argument about the, the normalcy of, of Nazis? Um, yes, to a degree. I think, in fact, the movie slightly overdoes it, uh, not as much as the book. Um, I helped Martin. I knew him already, and so he asked me if I would, uh, if I'd run through the manuscript, and I found about 50 mistakes, which he very gratefully accepted corrections to. Um, and I think it's a brilliantly written book, as with everything that Martin Amos wrote. But I do think it's quite mor morally problematical, and that, of course, gives it uh, a lot of its power and makes it thought-provoking. The, the film uh, is also, I think, very, very thought-provoking, but it does sort of um, avoid some of the problems that the book uh, got its way into. The book's about love. How can you be? How can you have love in a uh, in an environment like Auschwitz? Um, the, uh, the 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 movie uh, does sort of link up bourgeois normalcy of the home life of Rudolf Hirst, the commandant of Auschwitz, uh, with his perpetrating of the most appalling horrors. And it does it in a lot of very subtle ways. Uh, you hear shooting and screaming, for example, noises off. Um, Auschwitz and its mass murders are a kind of created, they're, they're, like, um, they're like a Greek tragedy where the action actually happens uh, off stage, as it were, but you left in no doubt as to what is going on. So I think it's an important and very interesting, thought-provoking film. What's morally problematic about the Amos <coughs> Well, as I said, I think it is uh, portraying these figures as uh, just normal human beings without any problems. Uh, you know, they're falling in love, they have human emotions and so on. Uh, and uh, if you look at the autobiography of Rudolf Hurst, the Commandant of Auschwitz, you see that what he's doing in the camp, the mass murders, the cruelty uh, of the camp uh, does have an effect. He's complaining. I don't think it's an excuse. He's saying it has an awful impact on his personal life. It's really kind of destroying his his marriage. And I think the contrast in the, as I said, in the movie, even more in the book, uh, is really overdrawn between bourgeois normality and absolute criminality. The fundamental point is one that I would agree with, I think. That is to say, these are human beings, they're not psychopaths or monsters in any general sense. I mean, I quote a journalist who went to, attended a trial of some of the, the concentration camps at Auschwitz uh, in Frankfurt in the 1960s. And he comments on uh, these former camp guards who'd committed the most appalling atrocities and murders and beatings and torture, uh, how they appeared in the court 20 years on as kind of like clerks and professionals and uh, just ordinary citizens. And that concealed this past of the most appalling nature. What do you make of the Arendtian thesis of the banality of evil, of Arendt's work and her analysis? Do, is that in some ways reflected in your book, Hitler's People, Hannah Arendt's analysis, that people were simply obeying what they were told? I think I do discuss it at some length because I have a chapter on Adolf Eichmann and Hannah Arendt, who is a German-Jewish philosopher. Uh, she um, attended the trial of uh, Adolf Eichmann, one of the main perpetrators of the Holocaust, the man who organized all the transports and so on. And she makes this comment about the banality of evil, but I don't think that, that uh, what you said is an accurate, accurate view. I think there are a lot of misunderstandings of what she meant. There was a lot of desire in the 1960s to portray these men as absolute monsters beyond the pale of humanity. And here he was in his glass-fronted dock in the trial in Jerusalem, looking again, just like a kind of pettifogging clerk, 
he didn't seem out of you know normal it didn't seem abnormal psychopathic or anything like that uh, and that's really what she's commenting on it's not she's not saying that he was just obeying orders that's a very widespread excuse given by nazi perpetrators when they came to trial and that isn't true at all people ordered to shoot jews for example were able to say no uh, without any consequences at all they just resigned and, and, and off they went um eichmann was an ideologue and arendt is perfectly well aware of this he's a man who is uh, he's not just obeying orders he is an enthusiastic ideological nazi uh, and that's what he's doing so that's what it looks like it seems to be is, is normal and that's the problem that Arendt was uh, wrestling with is that one of the problems richard with bringing these people so to speak to justice eichmann was tried um and when you bring an old man into a court as you suggested he appears more normal he appears like a clerk well he's not old um and one of the things about the nazis is that they were all very young so uh you know uh, when they uh, were former nazis who'd survived and were brought to trial in the 60s and 70s they were still middle-aged people they weren't ancient uh, and of course, the fact that some of the trials continued into the 1990s shows that by that time they were they were old. <coughs> As a censor, we, we talked about uh, Martin Amos's book Zone of Interest. Um, I thought in reading it that there was a, at least in some of the characters in the book, a, a sense of great guilt in Hitler's people and the, some of the characters you cover: Goebbels, Himmler. Um, striker eichmann of course was there any sense of guilt of this historic crime that these men collectively committed well i uh, quote some of heinrich himmler's speeches during the war which are very open about how uh, they are shooting people into pits how they're massacring huge numbers of jews in eastern europe and he says the ss remain honorable and remain decent which he means and it's not an accurate perception i think but he means that they didn't kind of plunder them uh, didn't abuse them didn't steal from them uh, and so on that's not no that's true really but he argued that this is maybe regarded as a crime by the rest of the world uh, but it's a historical necessity he says he says that the the ss are carrying out an historically necessary crime in a way that sort of admits it by by murdering millions of jews now um quite a few nazis uh, committed suicide at the end of the war joseph goebbels's wife magda for example wrote a letter a very revealing letter to her son by her first marriage uh, where she explains that she is going to kill her and Goebbels has six children because life will not be worth living after Hitler goes. Uh, and this kind of fanaticism, a bit like a cult, uh, a religious cult which self-immolates when, uh, when it can no longer carry on. It's uh, uh, inability to live, to envisage any kind of life after Hitler's gone. And you find these suicides, Himmler commits suicide, Goebbels commits suicide, uh, uh, Hitler himself, of course, uh, commit suicide. Uh, many generals, top civil servants, top uh, Nazi officials, they kill themselves. Those who remained showed virtually no sign of remorse, as far as I can see. They regarded themselves as victims. Uh, I even quote uh, Karl Brandt, who uh, eventually, was a, he was a leading surgeon in Nazi Germany, um, and he, by a series of chances, he ended up by running the the uh, the action action t4 it was called after uh the the uh, address tiergonstrasse of fear uh, of uh, hitler's hq in, in in berlin uh killing by gassing or, or poisoning or starving up to two hundred thousand mentally ill and mentally handicapped people and he didn't see that as a crime at all he saw he was he was still ranting on as he and as he uh, as he climbed up the scaffolds after he'd been found guilty of murder, multiple murders. 
that doesn't sound very reports. normal, very bourgeois to me, Richard. Well, in the circumstances of the time, you see, almost everybody, almost the whole medical profession, not just in Germany, regarded the improvement of the human race by eugenics as a major step forward. And that's people on the left as well as on, on the right. They thought that if you can eliminate defective human beings, you can perfect the human race. Uh, they couldn't see that everybody, including the mentally ill and the mentally, the mentally handicapped, had rights and were human beings. They disqualified them as, as, as human beings. Uh, and Brandt on the scaffold was ranting on so much, the executioner lost patience and put a hood over it, put the black hood over his head and pulled the lever. So, uh, and that's true of many others. And that's um, one of the most disturbing things about the whole phenomenon. What has it taught you, Richard? You've dedicated your life to studying these men, Goebbels, Himmler, Stryker, Hitler. Um, what has it taught you about the human condition? Uh, yeah, as you well, say, you were growing up in Essex. You saw mm. bombed out East London, Leytonstone. But what does it teach you or what has it taught you about evil? Are you, you seem to be suggesting that it, it's somehow, if not normal, understandable. Well, as I said earlier, you know, it's not the case that to understand everything is to excuse everything. Uh, you have to look at the historical circumstances, and, and that's one of the most important things. We are in, uh, you know, we, we, we have violence all, all around us. We have violence in ourselves, uh, and we can recognize these tendencies. We can control them and deal with them. That's, a, I think, a very important lesson. Another important lesson is uh, that con disqualifying people as human beings, calling them vermin or lice or uh, insects uh, or parasites, as the Nazis called the Jews, that is the first step towards actions of mass extermination. And that is some, that's where we have to draw the line and say, no, this will not do. Are you suggesting then that we all have a little bit of Hitler or Goebbels or Himmler or Stryker <laughs> or Eichmann in us? That we're all capable yes. of, of, that, uh, well, we of those kind of crimes? Potentially. Yes, it's just the circumstances are entirely different, of course. But yeah, we, have, we all have a potential for good or evil. Uh, and it's up to us, really, to make sure that the good wins out and that we do good rather than evil. Can I step on the